Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Lecture 7 Anthropology and Visual Media Scholars who have contributed to anthropological studies on cinema are not very high in number but cinema has been studied in anthropology uh, since the 1950s if we take Hort Horton's powder makers study as the starting point. She looked at Hollywood. Um, and uh, more recently, another American anthropologist, Sherry Ortner, has looked at uh, independent cinema in uh, America. Uh, more closer to home, we have more uh, studies by anthropologists on cinema. Tejaswini Ganti um, has done a very uh, clear and lucid uh, thorough study of uh, Bollywood and uh, Sarah Dickey uh, Ruse Geritsen and Anand Pandian have all studied um, Tamil cinema from an anthropological perspective. Now, some of these scholars have looked at the production side of filmmaking, um, while others have looked at the audience perspective. So, there is a variation in methodology here between studying the um, elite. Uh, the more powerful, the big studios, uh, film stars, uh, producers and directors um, as opposed to studying ordinary people who are uh, viewers or fans. So, there are different methodologies that are required in these two different settings. Broadly, most of the studies have concentrated on issues of identity, um, identity of class, caste, uh, regional uh, linguistic um, identity, uh, the link between uh, the kind of messages uh, that go out through films and national identity, um, identity about gender, uh, all these issues have come to the fore through these uh, studies on anthropological, um, uh, anthropological studies on cinema. Of course, here also um, uh, many scholars from other disciplines have looked at cinema which uh, are useful for us uh, to consider. Uh, for example, from sociology, history um, and uh, cultural studies for one, they all uh, offer a lot for us to understand about uh, cinema particularly in India. Uh, some scholars uh, who are very well known for their expertise on cinema include M. K. Raghavendra, Madhava Prasad, uh, Theodore Bhaskaran, M. S. S. Pandian, uh, Rachel Dwyer, Patricia Uberoy. All of them have thrown light on what cinema uh, can tell us if we look at it from an ethnographic perspective uh, and historical perspective and from a theoretical perspective. So, some uh, parts of uh, cinema, Indian cinema from some parts of India are more well studied than other parts of India. For example, there is a lot of literature on Bollywood. Uh, like I said, there are uh, good works on Tamil cinema, Telugu cinema. Uh, and Bengali cinema for example. We have fewer works on say Kannada cinema or any other languages uh, which are where you know the number of cinema movies produced are not so high in number. Um, so, obviously, there is still a lot more work to be done uh, in evolving a kind of large understanding of cinema across different parts of India. Bhojpuri cinema is now beginning to become a very important category of um, uh, uh, analysis uh, in understanding Hindi cinema because often times people confuse between Hindi cinema and Bollywood. It is important to remember that not all of Hindi cinema is produced only in Bollywood. There is a lot of Hindi cinema that is produced outside of Bollywood and Bhojpuri cinema is one example. 
and that has now come under uh, rigorous uh, analysis by research scholars and uh, we will be uh, looking at more uh, information from these studies which can tell us a lot about say regional lang linguistic and regional identity formation. But what do these studies uh, which have been established for some time tell us about cinema, what new light can anthropology throw on the understanding of cinema. One thing we know is cinema is not just about the number of films produced or the box office uh, earnings. Um, cinema is also about the process of filmmaking itself and how cultural notions and practices inherently involve themselves in this process of filmmaking. Um, because at the end of the day, films are produced by people and are seen by people. So, therefore, it is of interest to anthropologists to investigate this both from the producer's perspective as well as from the viewer's perspective. Let us start with the first comprehensive study of uh, cinema uh, which was done by uh, Hortens Powdermaker um, and her book is titled Hollywood Dream Factory. What are the main arguments in this book? Powdermaker um, was a student of Malinowski who studied anthropology at the London School of Economics and then went on to do uh, several other studies before she embarked on her study of Hollywood uh, in 1946-1947. So, we are talking about a study uh, which took place nearly 70 years ago. And, uh, it is still very rare for um, anthropologists to look at uh, media. It, it was extremely unusual for uh, an anthropologist to be looking at media. What was uh, Hortense Powdermaker's interest? Why did she want to look at this uh, Hollywood? She looked at Hollywood as a system uh, which if if studied can throw light on some aspect of American culture. She saw Hollywood as located in American culture and by looking at uh, Hollywood as, as a uh, society in itself or as she calls it a system, she calls it a system. So, it has its own rules, uh, its own regulations, its own rituals, superstitions. So, by looking at Hollywood as one would look at any other system, uh, she was trying to deduce whether that can tell us something more about American culture uh, by which she already makes a point that filmmaking is not something that happens in a vacuum somewhere outside, somewhere totally separated from the society where uh, the stories are emerging. She clearly locates it right in the American society itself, the American society of the 1940s, uh, early 50s and trying to understand what can this tell us uh, from an anthropological perspective. So, very unusual for her to have engaged with this research. Um, she uh, immediately if you read her book very early on, uh, she makes the point that uh, she sees uh, Hollywood um, as a manipulative as any other system of mass communication will be assumed to be. Uh, that was the thought at that period of time uh, that these kind of uh, large industries are uh, manipulative and uh, they can make the audience uh, see things that otherwise the audience will not see. Uh, and it was a kind of a negative attitude that was taken to uh, toward media. Uh, while Powder maker all says that in the very beginning of her book. She also, uh, she does not say that I give the audience uh, more agency, she does not say that at least at the beginning. Um, but what she also tries to do is to see what role can this uh, movie going be fulfilling in an individual's life. Why would people want to go to movies? What does it give them in return? 
and she argues that um, it is a form of escape. So, escapism as a, a notion that we know uh, very well now uh, starts emerging from this point uh, that a movie going as a form of escapism. So, she says that it gives people a form of escape from their everyday life. It also gives some kind of vicarious pleasure for ordinary people to see other ordinary people on screen, uh, you know, take on the big guys, so to speak, and uh, defeat them and overpower them and emerge successful, which is not possible for most people in their everyday lives. And therefore, seeing this play out on screen um, gives them some kind of vicarious pleasure. And to see some of the problems resolved, at least on screen, if not in their real lives. She concludes that these are the reasons why people actually go and watch uh, films. Another tension that she picks out in her study is about uh, whether making movies should be a business or is it an endeavor of art? Is it about creativity? Is it about passion? Um, and again, she places this not only within Hollywood, but she says this is a larger tension in American society itself. The tension between a pursuit of capitalism versus pursuit of, uh, you know, more aesthetic, um, otherworldly kind of endeavors. So, she says this is not something very unique to Hollywood. We, we cannot only blame Hollywood for having to deal with this issue. This is much beyond just Hollywood. Another, um, so she makes a lot of such uh, uh, points in her work. So, just to give an example, she looks and in one of her chapters, she looks very closely at the producers of movies. Uh, producers as in the production process itself and there are four main people that she identifies. One is the producer, the person or persons who finance the movie. Um, in some cases, it can be a big studio, a director, uh, the main actor, and writer. And she talks about how some of these uh, stakeholders have closer relationships with one person more than another. For example, the writer may be more engaged with the producer, uh, whereas the actor would be more involved uh, with the director. So, these kind of relationships are also explored, uh, but uh, um, she looks at very thoroughly at the kind of uh, issues that go on from the production point of view. So, one of the things that filmmakers were grasping with then and filmmakers are grasping with even now is how to make a successful film, how to make a film uh, become that will become successful. And obviously, there is no easy answer to it. Um, and one of the things they used to do in the 1940s in Hollywood, it seems, was to uh, do surveys amongst the audience and find out how they liked uh, a, this plot versus another and then see whether the successful plot can then be mass produced, you know, something like an assembly line. Uh, but obviously, it does not work that way at all um, because she takes up uh, the big hit films of that period in 1947-48 when she was studying uh, Hollywood uh, very thoroughly and she says the topics varied. Uh, there was a lot of difference between successful movies and no one could predict that because this movie or this theme was successful in 1947, the same theme uh, told in a slightly different manner might be successful in 1948. It was very hard to tell. And so, the producers were grappling with this issue um, significantly. And uh, so, on the one hand, there is a great interest in formula uh, producing uniformity, but on the other hand, producing a film is not uh, like manufacturing a car. You cannot uh, mass produce uh, 
you know a film in the same way that one can mass produce uh, a motor vehicle. So obviously this problem between uniformity and originality uh, was at the very center of Hollywood when she was studying um, this uh, system as it were in the 1940s. What we also learn and what is of uh, interest to anthropology uh, students is uh, her uh, method. Again, like I said, it is very unusual uh, for someone at that period of time to have gone and studied Hollywood from an anthropological perspective. How did she do it? So one thing was that Hopton's powder maker spent about one year in Hollywood uh, from 1946 to 1947. So she lived in uh, Los Angeles, um, she attended a lot of um, film shootings, she met a lot of people. Uh, she says that uh, she conducted some 300 interviews. Uh, which is remarkable uh, for um, an anthropologist to do in about a year. And uh, of course, one problem that anthropologists often encounter is questions about sample size. And um, Powder Maker discusses this at some length uh, in her uh, work. And she says that uh, she did what she could in the sense that she she made sure that though her sample did not stick to a particular number, uh, that it, it was representative, that it represented all those people who constitute what is called as Hollywood. So, there were enough writers that she spoke to, enough producers, um, enough directors and actors and camera persons, um, so that at the end of a year, she could get a fair sense of what the world of Hollywood is like. She also talks about um, the difficulty of taking a quote unquote neutral perspective and being just an observer. Um, and at the same time, uh, she emphasizes the importance of uh, not being um, you know, overwhelmed by talking to uh, people who are very popular uh, in uh, real life and, uh, and also it helped her that she was there uh, not to look for a chance in a movie. So, people were willing to talk to her and tell her many things. And this is, uh, this uh, work is also very important in terms of methodology for students of anthropology and sociology to understand about how does one go about studying um, these kind of worlds uh, which will require more attention to looking at the elite uh, people. So, even though her work is more than 70 years old um, and dated therefore, um, it is extremely important for us to look at what we can learn from Horton's powder makers pioneering study into the film industry. Um, I would next like to talk about one scholar's work because it is very close to powder makers work except that it is separated by more than 60 years and thousands of miles. And uh, this is uh, the work Producing Bollywood uh, by Tejaswini Ganti, who is um, a, an, a scholar of Indian origin uh, now teaching at NYU in the United States. Uh, Tejaswini Ganti has uh, more than a decade, nearly two decades of research in Bombay, um, in Mumbai, into the world of uh, Bollywood. And uh, her work producing Bollywood uh, looks at the world of Bollywood and ne uh, nearly uh, looking at the same issues like that of a powder maker into, uh, for example, what constitutes a, f uh, a good film, a successful film. How does one arrive there? What kinds of stakeholders are invested? Um, in uh, the creative endeavor in Bollywood. Uh, so, Tejaswini Ganti's uh, study nicely complements uh, what Horton's powder maker did uh, nearly six decades before her. 
And so producing Bollywood was published in uh, 2012 and in this uh, work as well like Powder Maker, Ganti also looks at uh, the producers and by this she means all those people who are involved in making a film, she calls them filmmakers and uh, she talks about uh, sentiments of disdain as she calls it and practices of distinction. Uh, which is very crucial uh, for people to organize themselves uh, in uh, Bollywood, um, uh, not uh, just uh, in terms of uh, uh, genres, but also in terms of how they uh, view the world of uh, Bollywood itself. And uh, this is a very important point to understand. So, all those people who are in the filmmaking industry are there uh, to make films, um, which is uh, like Powder Maker said at the end of the day is essentially about storytelling. How do you tell a good story? But amongst uh, the filmmakers that Ganti spoke to, there was a very clear um, uh, delineation between uh, the kind of people that make good films, uh, i.e. the ones who have passion for movies as opposed to those who come into the filmmaking world uh, with money and just want to make some movies. Um, so, everyone segregated everybody else as belonged to this other camp that is the one which did not have a creativity or passion at its heart and wanted to make films for the sake of uh, commercial success. So, the same point that powder maker talked about is it about is it business or is it art? What is filmmaking essentially about? And one of the other problems that Bollywood filmmakers face as did Hollywood filmmakers um, is also understanding the audience. That also is one big puzzle for them and of course, India is much more heterogeneous than uh, the American Hollywood uh, market is uh, in the sense that there are so many languages, so many kinds of themes uh, that are possible in filmmaking. Uh, some topics which might work more in what is called south market uh, may not work uh, in say the Hindi speaking belt and vice versa. So, understanding the audience is a big puzzle for filmmakers even those with uh, long experience in cinema. And uh, audience is also categorized. So, she talks about what she calls us audience imaginaries, um, how the audience is imagined. So, um, uh, some are uh, made for the urban market, uh, now increasingly called the multiplex audience. Some are uh, focused more on uh, uh, you know the mass audience. So, there is a lot of discussion uh, between about uh, class uh, versus the mass audience and how uh, uh, a movie X did not click because you know the mass audience did not get it or something like that. And also uh, there are differences uh, made between urban versus rural audience. Uh, family going or uh, family audience, for example, um, the audience for movies like uh, Habab Ke Hai Khan uh, versus um, other kinds of uh, films, uh, youth is one audience category. So, there are various segregations um, which the filmmakers engage as an exercise in order to figure out um, how to get. Uh, that hit which, uh, which can be possible if only you understood the audience right. Um, so, the same kind of um, desire to find that elusive formula exists in Bollywood as well, except that that formula is very elusive. And therefore, filmmakers sometimes just give up and say, I mean, you know, who understands the audience? I mean, none of us do really, uh, because even the very 
uh, long established successful actors and directors sometimes fail uh, to, uh, to guess whether a particular subject will work or not. And it may not necessarily be only about the subject, it could be about how the film was uh, packaged or who are the actors, you know there are so many factors that go into consideration and uh, filmmakers do think about it. Another thing uh, that Ganti's research and uh, powder makers research tell us one commonality between these two diff studies which took place, uh, remember one is from the 1940s and the other one is from uh, 1990s, early uh, decade of the millennium and yet uh, there are a lot of things that are common to both these uh, very in depth, very rich thorough studies and that is um, that one needs very um, uh, solid knowledge of the field. And um, in Ganti's case, uh, uh, it came with a lot more time uh, in that area as opposed to powder makers. But um, what we do uh, realize is that uh, the sort of ethnographic method that they both employed uh, served uh, very well in bringing out these kind of small um, intricate intimate details of how filmmakers talk about themselves, how do they talk about the world in which they operate Hollywood or Bollywood um, and this can be possible only uh, through this kind of uh, long in depth intricate research that they both engaged in. Uh, they built rapport, made connections across uh, stakeholders, they spent long time in their field site, all these things are very important. There is um, no shortcut uh, here and also looking at the films produced as texts will not tell us this information. This has to come and can come only through uh, these uh, methods alone. So, looking at films as texts can tell us many things, but they cannot give us a true insight into what the world of films is really like. And uh, we are enriched by these kind of methodologies that Ganti and Powder Maker have employed to tell us more about the world from which these movies are made. Uh, before Ganti, the person uh, whose work uh, kind of provided an entry point, uh, so to speak, for anthropologists to look at cinema um, in India uh, would be uh, one of the scholars would be Sarah Dickey. Sarah Dickey's work published in the 1990s uh, looks at Tamil cinema and she worked in the city of uh, Madurai, which is south of Chennai, about 500 kilometers from Chennai. Uh, one of the most ancient uh, cities uh, in, Tam in Tamil Nadu with a uh, long uh, tradition of uh, Tamil uh, scholarship and she looked at the fans um, and fan clubs um, of this uh, film star turned politician called M. G. Ramachandran or popularly known as M. G. R. And Tamil Nadu is a very interesting case because of a very close uh, relationship uh, between cinema and politics which is not always the case with uh, Bollywood for example um, or at least with electoral politics. Um, several chief ministers of Tamil Nadu um, have emerged with strong links to the world of cinema. Uh, just to name apart from MGR, uh, Mr. Karuna Nidhi and uh, Ms. Jay Lalita who also have had very strong links um, to the world of uh, cinema. There have been many scholarly works written about uh, this relationship between cinema and politics uh, from various disciplines and uh, I do not want to go into that here. I want to focus more on uh, what an anthropological approach to films uh, can tell us and what does Sarah Dickey's work tell us. So, her focus is on cinema and the urban poor. So, a lot of the fans of these film stars 
um, were not uh, from uh, middle class backgrounds or elite backgrounds, but from more working class economically poorer backgrounds. So, she wanted to look at why uh, would they, they be fans and why would they do what they do as fans? What is it that uh, is there for them? And uh, in, from her work, we come to know uh, that uh, people uh, or mostly men uh, that she uh, spoke to were attracted to the films of MGR. Uh, because of a particular kind of depiction of uh, machismo, um, if you like, um, which they called Viram. Now, Viram or uh, um, bravery is, a, is an attitude, is, a, is an aspect which is seen to be very essential for a Tamil male. And the idea was that um, MT MGR in his films exemplified that quality very well. In fact, one of his uh, films is even called Madurai Viran, you know, the brave um, young, the brave man of Madurai. So, by uh, these portrayals of uh, characters in his films, which are uh, apart from many other things, you know, being chivalrous and uh, being uh, strong and all of that, uh, this quality of Viram um, also imbued in uh, the actor a larger than life persona, which was then uh, transmitted uh, to the fan clubs via the fans and some scholars argue uh, that this um, provided a backdrop. Uh, for the actor uh, when he entered the political arena much later. Uh, MGR ha started acting in films um, nearly three decades before um, he became chief minister. Uh, but even so, uh, throughout his acting career, there was a direct engagement with cinema, but more than just the actor himself or herself. Um, you know, the, the role of fans and fan clubs um, are well brought out in Sarah Dickey's work. Uh, another activity, for example, that um, these uh, fans and fan clubs engaged in, particularly during actors' birthdays. Uh, people who are from Tamil Nadu and uh, Andhra Pradesh will be more familiar with this. Uh, there will be a lot of blood donation camps, uh, feeding of the poor, uh, you know, donation of clothes to the poor. Lot of charitable activities are undertaken in the name of the actor by the fans through the fan clubs. Uh, and uh, these kind of activities also help establish the actor as not just an actor, but much more than that. And uh, this is something that Ruth Gerritsen, uh, uh, sorry, Sarah Dickey, this is something that Sarah Dickey brings out in her work. Much later, many years later, in a similar vein, Ruth Gerritsen, a Dutch anthropologist, um, undertakes a, a similar study among fans of uh, Rajinikant, uh, the actor Rajinikant in Chennai. And uh, Ruth Gerritsen um, writes a, in this uh, beautiful article titled Cine Addictions, published in 2008, um, where she coins the term corpothetics. Uh, you know, the kind of strong identification between the corporeal, uh, the body and aesthetics uh, to fuse the connection between the film and the star. So, in that article, she looks at uh, the kinds of uh, pictures and hoardings that fans take out where their identity and the star's identity is all so mixed up um, that it is uh, very evident the, what role this actor occupies in their in the fans' lives. And uh, uh, the, again, proof of the very close relationship between films and fans and, and uh, later on perhaps uh, even with 
politics, electoral politics. Um, so, these uh, uh, studies uh, have also similar studies have also been undertaken in uh, Andhra Pradesh for example. Uh, this condition, this kind of historical links to social movements and the links between stars and writers and films and fan clubs does not easily translate into every other um, cinema uh, world in India. Uh, however, it is interesting uh, what an anthropological research can throw um, highlight upon uh, as to exactly how these relationships plan out, you know what kinds of pathways they take, um, a lot of it probably not necessarily strategic uh, for the fans at least, but how do they really play out and what can this tell us about uh, both cinema and politics. Um, so, these are some of the things that become very evident from anthropological uh, research on cinema, just one part of visual culture.